<laughs> Let's pray. God, we love you once again. We come to you. We just ask that we hear from you this morning. Thank you, Father, for your word. One of the one of the few things that the breath of life, your breath, has been breathed into that gives life. Let us hear from you. We love you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> All right, so we shift now from uh, the minor prophets of the Old Testament, which are full of doom and gloom, uh, to what is considered to be one of the most upbeat and positive books in the entire Bible. So we're jumping from one extreme uh, to, to the other. I got to visit with John Lancaster this week, and um, you know they're kicking off their series, uh, I think next week, on the Old Testament prophets. And, and so I, I was with him, and he said, hey, what advice would you give to someone who was going to preach through these books of the Old Testament? And, and I'm like, hey, look, they are, they're full of hard truths, okay? Uh, they're, they're, they're full of, of, of challenging thoughts that challenge the way we live, especially as, as Americans. And, and if you are an immature Christian, man, you may not get all these thoughts. You may not get the, why would God discipline and banish his people to exile? Like, if he's this all-loving God, why, why would he do that? Well, I don't an answer it now. We answered it in, in the previous weeks. Uh, why would God use a pagan country or pagan countries to, to carry out his discipline on his people? And, and, and from an American point of view, it just it doesn't make sense to most of us. But we're called to be followers of Jesus first. We're Christians first. But we are a disciple maker first before you are an, an American. And so... The beauty of every single one of those Old Testament messages with doom and gloom and challenging thoughts. Every single prophet also wrote about hope and restoration. And sometimes we just, you know, we love the train wreck. Well, that's where we turn our attention. We turn our attention to the negative stuff. But every single prophet that we study also points to the Messiah, points to the <laughs> hope and restoration of Life And so we jump from that. Now we jump to the New Testament. We're going to have a letter. This letter is to a group of people known as the Philippian Church. And it has one main theme throughout. And that's joy in all circumstances. Right? Like, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's not about a book of happiness, which is, is about my circumstances in the moment. This is a book about joy in all circumstances. And the words joy and rejoice occur 16, 17 times, depending on the translation. And in and, and, and my Bible, like my paper Bible that I actually read, I mean, it's, it's only, it's 1,600 words. That's it. And, 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 and repeated is this theme of joy. Now, here's the cool thing about this letter. Philippians is the most unusual letter that Paul, the author, wrote. Instead of writing to correct doctrinal matters, he writes basically a, a thank you letter to the church at Philippi that had been so generous in supporting him over the years. And we're going to get into that next week. We're going to, we're going to look at his opening prayer and his true thoughts. Words and phrases like affection for just flow throughout. So it's a thank you letter. All the other letters he loves them, but he's correcting something. He's correcting a thought. And so Paul, Timothy, Luke, Silas, these are the men that were traveling together. Uh, they first came to Philippi in about AD 51. And 11 years later, Paul wrote the letter to the church. And so I always tell people, if you're going to model ourselves after one of these churches that Paul wrote to, this is the one. Right? Like this, this is who we want to be. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians, the first chapter. We are going to look at two verses, but really and truly like two words. And so we've got about an hour on the first word, an hour on the second word. All right. Here we go. Philippians chapter 1, <laughs> verses 1 through 2. <laughs> Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord 
Jesus Christ. All right, so let's start with the very first word, Paul. All right, who's this guy? We, we cannot tell the story of the Philippian church without understanding what God has done in the life of the man named Paul. So we're very familiar with the birth of Jesus. Uh, we celebrate Christmas, but about six years after Jesus was born in Nazareth, uh, Bethlehem, sorry, the, the second most influential person in the New Testament was born in a town called Tarsus, which is in modern-day Turkey. So if you, if you want to go pull up a map, just look at the Mediterranean Sea, see where Turkey is, know that, that Tarsus is pretty close to the coast. Okay. He was born with a culturally important heritage. Paul, or, or Saul, as we're going to refer to him, Saul, at his, at his, as his birth name, he, he had the pedigree, right? He, he had the last name. He had the connections that you wanted to have. Think Rockefellers. You're rolling around with the name Rockefellers back in the day. You were somebody. All right, Kennedys. I mean, the Kennedys are still around. They're still in the news. They're still, they're still there. Like, like if we mention the Kennedys to this day, you, 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 you know what's going on in their world. Man, they, they have this, this pedigree. Waltons. Man, I'm going to tell you, I went to Walmart last night. If you ain't a donut this morning, you, let me just tell you. I risked my life so that you could have that thing. That place is nuts on a Saturday night. You all know the Waltons, don't you? I mean, you know. You know the Waltons. Yeah, that's the Waltons. That's right. You know the Waltons. How about this? In our state, all right, I'm not a fan. I don't buy it. All right? In our state, though, you know, man, there's a name that just carries a little more weight. All right? And that's that last name. Bryant. All right, he was some football coach at some school. He won a couple of games somewhere along the way. Anybody? I was hoping Jack and Michelle would be here. I was going to see if they were related. All right, I don't think they are. Jack wouldn't claim him because he's smart. Um, he's like, nope, we're the good stuff, the Bryant family. Our Bryants may not be related, but they are amazing in their own ways. But that, that, that's this guy saw. He's got the name. He's got the, the family heritage behind him. Saul was a Roman citizen to Jewish parents. And for you and I, it's like, oh, okay, big deal. No, it was a big deal. And, and God gifted Saul with this ability to argue and reason with people. He was an avid learner, and, and he loved to study the law. He loved to study the Old Testament law. Philippians 3 gives us a little bit of his heritage. I mean, he, he, he writes about himself. He's talking about boasting. And he says, I, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's like, you think you're somebody. Oh, I got more. He's out circumcised on the eighth day. Mosaic law. Check that. Of the people of Israel. Oh, I'm Jewish. Of the tribe of Benjamin, that's the one you want to be part of. A Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard, in, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, which means I've got authority over you who are not Pharisees. Okay, as for zeal, you know how excited, how excited I was? Persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. I not only memorized the first five books of what we know as the Old Testament. I learned them. I knew them word for word. I, I knew when the first time a thought or an idea, the first time the word love was ever mentioned, I can tell you where it is in the Torah. I know the law. I know the law so well. I know it inside and out because I have this special calling on my life to hold you accountable. That's our man. And as he got older, as he went through the processes, he was chosen to study the Torah in Jerusalem with a very respected teacher named Gamaliel. And under his leading, Saul goes on to become this incredible, devout Pharisee. Now, 
understand the Pharisees. Veggie tales makes them out just to be bad people. Okay. They weren't necessarily all bad, right? Like, I mean, they were raised up within this culture and they were passionate about their calling. They were passionate about, about how God had put them in this place, or so, so they thought. And so Pharisees, if you were, they were scholars and community leaders, and they had significant influence over political and religious standards, especially because the laws were still rooted in Judaism. And they were all the Mosaic law. And so the Pharisees were students of both the law and the Torah, and their expertise in both made them powerful authorities over the people of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Now, the Romans didn't have much for them. Okay? They're like, you people be you people. So within their sect, within Judaism, the Pharisees were the stuff. By the time the events of Acts chapter 3 are taking place, Saul is on the move in Galilee. And he is taking this Christian movement seriously. As the church launched in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, and things started to happen, Saul is already over here working. And he's doing everything he can to stop this Christian movement. So we're going to cover about 13 chapters of the book of Acts in a very short period of time. So you just, just follow along. You can go back and read it. Okay. When Peter and John, one of their first miracles, they get arrested for healing a lifelong paralyzed man. They are arrested, they're brought before the courts. Uh, they're thrown in jail, they spend the night in jail, and as they're brought before the Sadducees, they defend their actions, okay? Like, like they're now on trial. They defend their actions by preaching to the courts, right? Like the people that are trying, Paul, I mean, Peter and John, they're like, um, what's your defense for doing this over here? You killed Jesus. You're to blame for all this. You killed Jesus. You're the one that said he needed to go to the cross. Y'all are the one that went, and, and, and they go back and forth. Like, like the, these are the people that, that they're, they're, they're trying, right? And, and these are the people that are judging them, and, and they're just blaming them over and over and over again. And here's the thing. As they're doing this, as they're standing up in these temple courts and they're being bold, more and more people are surrendering, surrendering their lives to the man named Jesus who claims to be Lord of heaven and earth. There's a boldness there. And then so as you track the story, there's a few more arrests and there's a few more miracles by God. At one point in time, all the apostles are arrested. And God does this, this little get out of jail free thing. You know, well, he, he does this little miracle and all the prison doors are, are opened up. And, but he commands the apostles, hey, just go on down to the temple courts and, and tell everyone of this new life that they have in Christ. And so the next morning when the Pharisees and the Sadducees get there, they're like, all the apostles have been in jail. They go to get them out of jail. It's like, uh-oh, they're not there. Like, where are they? The doors are locked. The Bible says it. The doors are locked. Where are they? And so somebody says, hey, these people you're looking for, they're down here in the temple courts. And here's what it says. This is very interesting to me. I'm not picked up on this detail. But here's what it says. The Bible says that this ruling class, Pharisees and Sadducees, that they were filled with jealousy over what God was doing. And so they go down to the temple courts. They find the apostles preaching. And they bring them back to the court. And here's the thing. The arresting officers dared not use any force whatsoever. Because these apostles have become so popular with what God was doing within them. And as the Sanhedrin went back and forth on how to punish these men for breaking the rules, Gamaliel, the same man who mentored and taught Saul, gives some sound advice. And this is Acts chapter 5. I don't think it's up there. But just listen. So we've got the apostles over here. They're arrested. Right? The Sanhedrin's like, we've got to do something. They're causing a ruckus. 
but they're so popular. Like if we find them guilty, if we punish them, then the people are going to revolt. They're going to actually, at one point in time, they're going to stone and kill us, is what they say. And so as they're, the Sanhedrin is debating, this is what Gamma, Gamma Lidl says, men of Israel consider, I, I stumble over that word every single time this week, men of Israel consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. This is his advice to the Sanhedrin. This is the guy that mentored Paul, Saul. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So Paul's mentor shows up and says, let me tell you, like, like, like if, if this is from human origin, it's going to fail. Just let it go. Don't worry about it. But if this is from God, you, God's just going to track you. I mean, he's just going to train you. He's, you're just going to get run completely over. You stand no chance of stopping this. Let them go. And so they listened to the reasoning, and they said, all right, but before you go, we're going to flog you, and we're going to tell you not to talk about Jesus anymore. And what was the apostles' response to that? What that? We praise the Lord. We were worthy of being beat. Like, like that's their response. We, the, the sermon is not about this right here, but I'm telling you, I, I, I can't go through that. Like, like, that's their response that Jesus means so much to me that because I'm proclaiming his name, I have just been flogged, and it's pretty cool. That's a cool thing. And so the apostles are released, and the church continues to grow. But they don't shut up. They just keep on talking about Jesus. They keep on meeting together. They keep praying. They keep, they keep doing all things in Acts chapter 2. But with growth, there are needs. So there were these particular widows that were being ignored. And so the apostles appoint seven men. And it says that they were full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. To look after the needs of these widows and orphans. And of those seven, there was one man that, that kind of stepped forward, and the Bible says that he was full of God's grace and power. And he could perform signs and miracles. He could perform, he could perform all these, these amazing acts of God. We're up to Acts chapter 6 and 7 right now. This man's name is Stephen. So Stephen is arrested, and he is brought before the Sanhedrin. And he's like, hey, when the other apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin, they accused them of, 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 of hanging Jesus on a tree. I'm going to do the same thing. And so he gets up there, and he blasts them. He preaches, and he preaches, and he preaches, and he gives the Sanhedrin blood for. And, 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 and as they just become enraged, they're furious. They're like, all right, it's time to stone him. And so they take Stephen out of, of the, uh, the city center. They take him out to where they stone people, and they stone this man to death in Acts chapter 8 verse 1 says this and Saul approved of their killing him on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began 
to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. That's the next couple of verses. Saul began to destroy the church, the Bible says. He went house to house. Think about it. Think about your street. Think about this man who has the power and the authority to come and he dragged out not just the men, but the women, leaving the children. And he put them in prison or had them stoned, had them killed. And, and, and here's the thing, and there are historical documents that point to this. This man, Saul, at this point in his life, was known for two things. Fear and chaos. He would do everything in his power to disrupt the church, going door to door. And he's ripping households apart for anyone who openly proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah. The, the, the closest I've ever come to this was in Mexico. Uh, Chris Garcia and, and her people had, had planted this church out way out in the middle of nowhere. And we drove a couple hours to get there, and we're at this church, and, and the service starts. At, and, and no offense to any of our, you know, his, Hispanic heritage, but the service starts at ten o'clock, and so by you know twelve thirty they show up, and we start worshiping God. And 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 then it's just this afternoon thing. And so we're in the building, and we're we're doing our thing, and we're having church. And all of a sudden you hear pop, pop. I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, and they're just worshiping, man. They're sitting there singing, and, I, and, it, and it's like hail is falling on this metal roof. And I'm just like, man, what, what's going on? Like, is nobody's bothered by this? And then Chris stops the service. And she's like, yeah, this is the Catholics. This is Catholics. I'm going to talk about Catholics again, so we can get them back in a minute. This is Catholics trying to disrupt our service. They stand out there and they just throw rocks at our building for hours on end while we're in here. I'm like, well, what happens if the service is over? Well, if they're throwing rocks, you get hit by rocks. So we just stay in here and we keep worshiping. We outlast them. And I'm telling you right now, man, we stayed there the whole day and they're the ones that got tired because they don't run out of rocks in Mexico and there's rocks everywhere. <laughs> and and they, they just got tired of throwing rocks and they eventually went and that's when the service was over. Is when they got tired of throwing rocks. Man, and Paul, Saul at this point in time, so he's just traveling around. He's trying to disrupt everything. So he's this man that's known with, about fear and chaos. That's what he's known as. He was everything they could to avoid him. Acts chapter 9 says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. I mean, we're, we're about halfway, a little almost halfway through the book of Acts. And this dude is wreaking havoc to the point that, that Luke, who goes on to become a friend of this man Paul, writes this about him. He was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Saul's a bounty hunter. I mean, like, he's, he's, he's looking for you. And he's got the letters from the head honchos in Jerusalem at, at the main temple. And they're like, if we find somebody between here and there, We've got the letters to say we can drag you back to Jerusalem and have you thrown in jail. So on the way to Damascus, he encounters Jesus. He's on a mission. He's got his own agenda. He's got a posse with him. They are traveling to Damascus. And, and Jesus comes out of nowhere. There's lights from heaven. There's flashes all around. And Saul just falls to the ground. And he hears this voice. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? His response as he's laying on the ground. Who are you? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what to do next. You should have noticed something about this conversion that takes place. Jesus does not say, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting me? 
And there's, there's some deep lessons there for us. As you go through your stuff, as, as you go through the spiritual attacks, as you go through the things that, 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 that are, are waged on your life, you're not alone and it's not just you. I mean, these people were literally being drugged out of their homes. They felt the physical pain of, 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 of being thrown into jail. They, they, they felt the emotional scarring of, of being separated from their family. The humiliation that came with all of that. And Jesus does not say, why are you persecuting my people? But you are persecuting me. Why are you doing it? Church, I think you need to know that you're going through the stuff. Jesus is there with you. So this man Saul goes on into Damascus. And there was a disciple, the Bible tells us. A man by the name of Ananias. He was in there in Damascus and he was doing his thing. He's a disciple. God speaks to him in a vision and says, go down to Straight Street. There's a man there from, from Tarsus who I need you to pray over. And I was like, uh, wait a minute. What do you mean there's a man from Tarsus? You mean the guy that's trying to arrest and kill me? That guy? Huh? Let me ask you, church, how would you like that task? I mean, you're in a night. You're sitting there. You're just doing your thing, man. You just you just had your little quiet time in the morning. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so great. Oh, Lord, thank you for this food. Amen. You did all that kind of stuff. But the next thing, God said, I need you to go and pray with this man that yesterday would have killed you. You up for that task? <coughs> I mean, you think inviting your co-worker out to eat lunch so you can talk about Jesus is scary. God's like, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. He's been there for three days. He's blind. He's not eating. I want you to pray with this man. And the Bible says that as Ananias showed up and prayed with him, that scales fell off his eyes and he could see. It says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was baptized. After getting something to eat, he immediately went to the temple and started preaching that Jesus is Lord. Four days ago, this guy is on the road trying to do everything he can to stomp out the, the movement that Jesus is Lord. And with an encounter with God, he is now. Hadn't been taught. He, he hadn't had the, the Sunday school, the Jesus only Sunday school curriculum. All right, he hadn't had any of that stuff yet. But he is in the temple and he is proclaiming. He is proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. Then he started preaching. And so now other apostles, they start to get to meet this guy. And they're a little hesitant, as you can imagine. Like, is this real? Is this like a ploy? Like, is he trying to pull a fast motor? Is he just pretending that, that he's one of us so that he can get into our inner circle and then and then destroy us? And so, man, they're, they're hesitant. There's a guy that Bar uh, named Barnabas that steps up to the plate. And Barnabas was apparently a big dude. That's what the, that's what the historians say. And Barnabas is like, I got it. I'll watch him. Barnabas starts to pour into him. And for the next decade, 14, 15 years, give or take, Saul being discipled. And I know for us it's just a couple of chapters of some movement. But there's a time period in here of, of 10 plus years of people, apostles, Peter, John, James, these people investing in Saul. Saul's hanging out with him. He's at the temple. He's preaching. He's doing some of the things that, that, that they do. And over the course of time, Saul drops his very Hebrew name, King Saul, and he takes on a very Gentile name, Paul. Because he understands the mission that he is on. He has lost his identity, even by changing his name of who he was. That desired name in Tarsus. He loses all identity. And he says, I no longer identify with the person of my past. I am now Paul, as we'll see in just a second, a servant of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to take on this Gentile name because I am going into the world to do the very thing that Jesus has commanded us to do. And so Paul, 
Paul's mission is to take the gospel to anywhere and everywhere. And he has this great desire of taking it to Rome. His people. I want to go to my people. In journey after journey, Paul would encounter new people. Sharing about his and who the Lord was. And on one of those occasions, he came across this young man by the name of Timothy. And Timothy is being, being raised by his mom and his grandma. Or Nana, as it would really, this is what the real Greek translation is, Nana. We don't know much about Timothy's father other than that he was Greek. All right, so as a young man, Paul's like, you want to identify with these people? You got to get circumcised. Wow, that's much better at eight days old versus a teenager. So Paul becomes this father figure to this young disciple, and he takes him on a couple of missionary journeys. And in one of those journeys, they land in a town called Philippi. He'd not been there yet. This is a first. And here's the interesting thing about the events that take place in Philippi. As an Orthodox Jewish man, okay, and this is still a practice that's done today. As a devout Jew, they would pray some version of this prayer every single morning. And in their prayers, they would thank God that they are not a woman. Thank you, Lord, that you did not make me a woman. They would thank the Lord that they are not a slave. And they would thank the Lord that they are not a Gentile. Every morning, as they're praying, these devout Jews would just thank God. Thank you for not letting me be some of the lesser people in society. Right? Now, here's the interesting thing about the prayer that Paul most likely prayed. I don't see it. I don't have the recording of it, but Jews still pray this prayer to this day. So Paul shows up in Philippi. The first encounter he has is down by a river. It's this lady by the name of Lydia. She's a seller of purple. She's got her own business. She's in the textile business. And she's boss lady. I mean, like, she's like the stuff. I mean, she's supplying clothing to, to, to all the important people who can afford her stuff. She is very influential. She's already a worshiper of God. I mean, she's there. She's worshiping the Lord. Paul's just showing up by the river looking for a quiet place to pray. And he starts talking. And she's like, give me more. Tell me more. It says that she surrendered her life to Jesus. And, and, and Paul shares with her who Jesus is. And she and her household are like, I am in. And then she's like, y'all come back to my house now for dinner. And it says that she was very persuasive. She got them to come back. No matter what you're doing, you're coming back to my house. And we're going to continue these conversations. So the first person that Paul meets and shares his faith with is a lady. The second one is also a lady, but she's a slave. This is Acts chapter 16. This is a, a great story. Uh, Paul's there. They're doing their thing. And, and this slave lady has a, she's possessed by a spirit. And, and, the, and the spirit is announcing who Paul is. This is a man of God. This is a man of God. And this goes on day after day. This is a man of God. Is there is they're doing their work? Is there teaching? Is they're doing having the conversations? This is a man of God. And you know what? Paul, uh, he kind of missed the mark here a little bit. It, it was not out of compassion for what was going on in her life. It was out of you're annoying me. Spirit come out. And the spirit left this lady. Now here's the issue. There was actually a little bit of trafficking going on. Trafficking is big in our culture right now, I mean, it's, 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 it's another topic for another day, but that's what was happening. These people were using this lady and the demon that was in her, in her to make them money by telling the future, by prophesying events. That's what they're doing. And so Paul, out of frustration, is like, come on up out of there. And so the demon leaves, and now she's there. 
Well, these guys that technically owned this lady or thought they did own this lady, they get mad, they call the police, they, they arrest Paul, they arrest Silas, they, they beat him up, they flog him, they throw him into jail. A slave girl who was once demon possessed is now in the line. The third encounter is with the man who's responsible to watch Paul and Silas and all the prisoners. <laughs> and so Paul gets beat up, he gets flogged, they throw him in the jail, he's done nothing wrong. And about midnight, Paul and Silas, they start doing what you and I do. Singing some hymns. Right? Because that's what we would do. We got great attitudes. We're just so grateful, aren't we, that we got beat up, that we got flogged. They start singing these hymns of praise. And, and out of that, there's a miracle that takes place, and the doors open up. And, and, and the jailer's like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And Paul's like, don't kill yourself. We're here. We're, we're, it's all good. And, and Paul and this jailer start having this conversation. What's, what's happening? What's going on? And, and Paul is able to share with, with this Gentile who Jesus is. And immediately, it says, that this guy asked Jesus into his life. He understood what this was, and they were, they were baptized. And, and then, then, then the next day, they, they went through all the, the, the rigmarole. Paul's been here a week. He has three encounters. A slave, a woman, and a Gentile. Paul shares the good news of Jesus with these people in Philippi. And out of this, a church is planted. That's Paul. Go back to Philippians 1. And And his conjunction, I'm just kidding. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let me talk about this word servant here. I know it's late, and I'm, I'm about halfway done. Um, the word servant here is, is doulos. Okay, that's, that's what it means. The word means slave. But, but don't think about transatlantic slavery that was part of our country's past. Okay, don't, don't, don't think of that. Bond servant is, is the best use of this word in the English language. So what's a bond servant? It means that I have a debt to you. Okay? Instead of paying cash for my debt, I actually come and just work it off. And it, it, it was actually a mutual agreement. We would agree to the terms, and I would just show up, and I would, you know, cut grass, I would do the things, and once it is worked off, I could continue working for you, usually out of affection for it. And you start studying some of these, these New Testament places like Ephesians that talk about masters and treating their slaves, that, that's what they're talking about, this, this, this relationship here. And as a loyal bond servant, Everything is about you. So if I'm your bond servant, everything in my life is about you. I'm not going to my nine to five. I'm not going to, I am going to do whatever it takes to work off the debt that I have to you. How about this? My life revolves around you. How about that? The Jewish understanding as Jesus taught it in, in Matthew 20, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Okay, that, that verse, it's all about significance. I find your existence in this world to be more significant than mine. Therefore, I am a servant to you. That when, when Jesus spoke those words, that's what the Jews heard and, and understood. That this man, Jesus, who's the Messiah, says that my life is more significant than his own, proven on the cross when he died for me. If that is the language. That is what Paul is saying to the church. Your life is more significant than my own. Can we say that about you? 
Does your life truly revolve around Christ Jesus? Are, are you willing to, to part ways? Are you willing? Not yet. Are you willing to part ways? I'm telling you, I got more. With your old identity. Are you willing to part ways with your calendar, with your wallet, how you spend money so that you can be a servant to other people? Because that's Paul and Timothy to Jesus Christ. And so that's who wrote the letter. Now, who's the letter written to? It's written to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, I, I, I'm going to cut out the overseers and deacons part. Okay, We're just going to talk about the saints right now. To all the saints who are in Christ Jesus. Now, saints is not a word uh, that we use a lot culturally, right? Like, like well, we, we don't refer to one another as saints. Okay, we talk about a football team that's down the road a little ways, that they're no good, so we don't really talk about them a whole lot. Uh, most of the time when we use saints amongst each other, it's, it's used with a, a negative connotation, like, well, I'm no saint. Like, you want me to, I'm no saint, I'm not a saint. Okay, it's interesting, I hate that, that, uh, that Chester walked out for a minute, but Jackie Mackin was referred to as a saint by, by somebody one time, and it truly meant you are what this is right here. You are a saint. So I've done some research on how to become a saint. There's, there's two primary ways to become a saint. You can do it within the Catholic Church. Okay? The Catholic Church, I'm making fun of them, they, but they have this, this process. And sainthood is something that Catholics desire. But here's the thing with becoming a saint. You have to be nominated. You can't nominate yourself. Because part of the nomination process is you've got to be dead for at least five years before you, that can happen. Right? So you've got to be dead and gone five years before you can actually become a saint. So go figure. There it is. But, but people on your behalf would say, hey, we want to nominate this person as a saint. So after you've been dead five years, all right, you're, you're presented before you know, a, a board of, of, of bishops at, at first, and, and, and you must be considered a servant of God. So you've got to have a good reputation. Okay? And, and so there's a waiver that, that is granted. The bishop of the diocese, where the person died, can open up this investigation into the life of the individual to see whether they live their lives with the sufficient holiness and virtue to be considered for sainthood. We've got to do some Facebook stalking on your life. I mean, we're digging into your past. We're digging into your credit scores. We're digging into everything. We want to know all about who you are. And if you kind of meet the approval here, okay, you, you kind of get taken to this next level. And once evidence is gathered on the person's uh, life and needs, including witness testimonies, there's, there's more sufficient evidence the bishop then asks the congregation for the causes of the saints. I know this is confusing. This department then makes recommendations to the Pope on the saints' uh, behalf for permission to continue to go on with the case. All that's like one thing. We're just being very thorough with who you are. And once you're approved here, you can be called a servant of God. Okay? So right now, none of y'all going to the Catholic Church are servants of God. Then we look at your life beyond, a little bit deeper, and you have to show some form of heroic virtue. Think Mother Teresa. And so this congregation for the causes of saints, they scrutinize the evidence of the candidates' holiness work and signs that people have been drawn to through prayer. Then you've got to perform some miracles. There has to be evidence of not just one, but two miracles in your life. Alright? Like, man, I was with him one day and we were just walking down the road. He just started up there. Right? And there has to be evidence of it. Like, other people have to see this. And then, after you get to this level right here, you go before the Pope. And the Pope has the final say whether or not this person lived a life of heroic virtue. Then you're called venerable, respectable. Once the Miracles are verified, then you become a saint. There's all kinds of patron saints. 
all kinds of patron saints. A lot of people have gone through this process. Arms dealers have a patron saint. And what a patron saint means is, is you represent a group of people or something that people can pray to. And so if I'm, you know, wanting to sell some arms illegally, I, I would pray to the patron saint of, of whatever his name is, Adrian of Nicodema, uh, and, 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 and I would pray to him that, Lord, let these deals go through smoothly. Arms dealers have their patron saint. Coffee house owners, now I'm intrigued with this one, coffee house owners have a patron saint. Comedians have patron saints. Gamblers. Poor college students. So you people that are parents to, you know, maybe you want to check into it. Maybe you, Joseph of Cropatino is the guy you need to start praying for. Those seeking lost items. There's a saint that you can pray to if you've lost an item. Um, Y'all may know somebody. Women seeking a husband. There's a saint for that that you can pray to. Bachelors, I mean, I don't know why these two just don't get together and we can work all this out, but bachelors, St. Christopher, if you have a splitting headache, there is a saint for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's called lunch. Um, saint of unattractive people. <laughs> His name is Dronco, of all things. Carlo Akitus is the first millennial in the process of becoming a saint. First millennial, okay? He's the saint of youth computer programming and gamers. So if you're trying to be a gamer, if you're struggling, you got a guy you pray to. Just saying. Saint. That's one way of becoming a saint. Or you can go about this the other way. <coughs> Paul starts his letter to the saints. <coughs> to the people who have said, you know what? I want to become a saint this way by acknowledging that Jesus died on the cross for me. That I am a child of God. That that, that is the other way to, to become a saint. And, and I'll tell you right now, the, 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 the eternal reward of it is much more much more satisfying than, than what happens if somebody's just praying to you as you go on into the afterlife. And here's what he says. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Church, because of the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross and through the sanctification process of this man Paul upon the complete surrender of his life to Jesus, he is no longer Saul who brings fear and chaos to lives. But he's Paul. The man who brings grace and peace. So as you walk out this door, if you do whatever you do today, you go into the week, are you known for your grace It only comes through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in your life. <clears throat> but do people look at your life and do they see chaos? Do, do people look at your life and they're like, what is that? Do I want that? Or does grace and peace go before you? Father, I pray that we can learn more and more about this man Paul and his life and how you changed his life. Father, I, I, I pray that we can die to self as Saul did on that road. When he encountered you, he was radically changed. So Father, I, I pray that we have this lesson of this man and the work. Let us not be people of chaos. And 
And, and let us not justify our actions based on human standards. But, but filter this through a life surrendered to you. God, I, I repent before you now for the times where I, I run wide open. I, 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 I neglect you often. I focus not on eternal things and, and your kingdom, but I focus on me and mine. God, I pray that I am not somebody who brings chaos to others. But let me bring grace and peace that is found only in Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we ask these things in your Son's name.